guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat, episode 138, featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with Mr. David Fox. Now, Mr. Fox is one of the founding members of Lucasfilm Games, and he's got wonderful stories about Rescue on Fractalus, Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, and much, much more. If you're a fan of those old Lucasfilm, LucasArts games, or just like adventure games in general, uh, you're going to be really psyched for this interview. We've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Fox. All right, folks, I am here with David Fox. He is one of the founding members of Lucasfilm Games, a company you're probably familiar with if you like adventure games at all. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Electric Eggplant with his wife, Annie. It's uh, great to have you on the show, David. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, now we were talking. Uh, you've got a new project that you're working on. There's, you can't tell me a lot about it. It's kind of. <laughs> it's a lot of this is uh, still under wraps now. But could you just give me a little, a little hint of what's going on with this Rube Goldberg project? Yeah. Well, a um, long time ago, um, I mean, I've always been interested in in those types of machines. Like Rube Goldberg is known for the crazy contraptions that he did. I mean, a lot of people know the word as an adjective for crazy devices that are overly complicated to do very simple things. But, you know, Rube Goldberg was a cartoonist that died in 1971 who was famous for, for decades uh, from the 20s or 30s all the way through, you know, 60s and 70s for doing many different comic strips, including his crazy contraptions. Um, and I remember as a kid, always loving to look at those and watch him and lovingly humor and the irreverence. And more recently, you know, seeing games that were similar that sometimes called themselves Rube Goldberg-like games. Um, Incredible Machines would be one, and there's several that are on, including that one, that are now on iOS. And thinking, oh, it'd be really fun to do a Rube Goldberg-like uh, game myself. And did some internet searches and saw that for some reason, no one ever did an official Rube Goldberg game. So I found their website um, one Sunday in December, sent them an email, and the next morning got a phone call from this woman named Jennifer, who identified herself as Rube Goldberg's granddaughter, and said, yes, let's let's talk. So I have the rights to do it, and we're in the early stages, early design stages right now. But uh, more, more coming, more news, hopefully, as we get further along. Do you have a, a, a new, uh, a unique spin you're going to take with the with the concept, or? Well, the the one thing that I find is missing from most of the ones I've I've seen is humor. Um, I mean, if you think back to the adventure games that we used to do, that was one of the earmarks of the Lucasfilm games, Lucasarts early adventure games you did was like this wacky, kind of reverent humor. And I want to take, in fact, if you think about those games, in many ways. They were very large Rube Goldberg-like devices where you had to pick up strange objects from one place or another place and do things that convert them to other objects and combine them and make those things happen. So the whole whole game was essentially this Rube Goldberg device that has a story in, you know, in the middle of it. Um, so I want to take that quality of humor and Easter eggs and things that you didn't expect to happen and let you experiment and, and of course, Rube Goldberg stuff usually has uh, animals and cats and parrots and and um, tiny little people and all sorts of things in the devices that you know. So it's not really a, a physics simulator type game like most of the current ones are, but there are those elements. So this will be very true to his his work. You go to RubeGoldberg.com and you'll see a whole bunch of archive of all all of his cartoons and see what we're looking at. We also want to replicate his style. So we really want to do it in that 1930s and 40s illustration style, but in color. Something tells me that of all the designers in the world, you are the one to do this. <laughs> you know, I think that's what I, what they figure it out. That's, it's a look at my background. This is why I want to do it. And I've, I've been very passionate about it. So it should be a lot of fun. Well, uh, Dave, let's talk about your early days, you know, how you got into this uh, business. I was looking at the Wikipedia page about you, and it mentioned, uh, and actually your electric eggplant page too. They talk about this finding some discarded cells, I guess some cartoon cells from the Flintstones, and you uh, were able to make a cartoon out of these. I mean, what, what's going on there? Can you? Well, I was used to love animation. I I live, I grew up in Los Angeles, 
I now live in North, Northern California, but back then I grew up in Los Angeles and, and uh, it was actually part of my life was in Studio City, which is where a lot of film studios were. Um, and Hanna-Barbera Studios were a bike right away. And for some reason, they just dumped their cells out into the garbage bins, the big dumpsters. I would go dumpster diving and come back with boxes filled with cells. And generally they were in sequence and numbered. So I, I get a whole series of, of sequences from, a, from some scene. And mostly it was Flintstones stuff at the time. And go home and take my eight millimeter camera, put it on a tripod and come up with a stand and, you know, go single stepping through it and experimenting and kind of seeing how, you know, very much like how I guess I did with games later on was how did, how did they do it? How could you do animation? And um, did my own stop motion for a while, was playing with things and, and uh, you know, went off into another direction. One thing I didn't like about it was how tedious it was um, to do that whole process. But I did a lot of it when I was like, you know, 12, 13 years old. Yeah, I've heard of found footage before, but I mean, this is, this oh, blows my mind that yeah, the, I, Hannah I, Barbera just throwing these things out. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, they were prized possession. And unfortunately, my mother didn't realize how important they were to me. Oh, and she no. dumped the whole box at some point. <laughs> so, you know, I walked into uh, uh, these art galleries and see one cell from one show, you know, for one thing, selling for like a hundred or five hundred thousand dollars. And I had like stacks and stacks, like, you know, literally, uh, you know, maybe a foot thick of a birth of cells. So, so uh, I guess maybe I wouldn't have been, maybe I would have been independently wealthy and wouldn't end up going into games if I, if that didn't happen, who knows? <laughs> maybe, maybe some other kid found those, found them again and uh, ah, <laughs> launched another career. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, talk about this uh, Marin computer. Is that the right, is that how you pronounce this? Uh, Marin computer? Marin. Oh, Marin Computer Center, 1977. Yes. Uh, this was uh, the first, the first public access micro uh, computer center you know it sounds uh you know that sounds amazing just just in and of itself but I mean, what, what was the sort of agenda and purpose of the center uh well the the story goes back a little bit further it, for the year before that i was looking at what i wanted to be doing next and i ended up um realizing that if i could somehow come you know figure out how to do games um I wasn't a programmer at the time. I had taken a couple of programming classes, you know, in high school and in college, but not to the point where I consider myself to be a programmer. Um, I was envisioning some sort of a immersive environment, almost like a Disneyland, where you could go and be immersed in adventure-like games and learn something about yourself. So it was really wasn't just for fun. It was actually as a kind of a self-improvement or, or per, personal awareness or enlightenment type of a, a process. Um, there, there's a, a real, after, after having this vision later on, I, I read uh, Orson Scott Card's book, Ender's Game. And there's this whole subplot in there with this uh, computer game that Ender, the main character is playing, where it's very much like that, where the computer is sentient enough to know what Ender's, blind spots were and it would devise adventure game puzzles that it knew he couldn't figure out until he overcame the way he used to, he was used to thinking basically it, it, uh, enlarge his viewpoint and his point of view of the world and then he would come up then the, the solution would come up and he'd end up with another problem like that so i thought that was great that was kind of like what i was looking for so i figured if i want to do that um end up doing games and and theme park level stuff. Um, place to start might be learn how to program, and let's put together a, a public access nonprofit organization where we could start with uh, ten computers and invite the public in to play with them, teach classes, uh, take the, the computers out to schools and teach uh, classes there to the kids and to the teachers. Uh, we did field trips. We had birthday parties. Kids would come in rent you know a bunch of computers in a block for an hour and play the different games that we had and we did that for ran for about uh, we were involved for five years and during that process you know of course we started with with a series of computers um our first ones were the 
probably totally unknown processor technology, Solve 20, which was a CPM or, or 8080 based um, S100 bus computer, which which we chose over the Apple II because it could do upper and lower case. And we said we thought at the time we we got them that we'd be doing a lot more. Um, people would be coming in for word processing, and you had to have upper and lower case. And we didn't realize to what degree people would be coming in to play games. I actually remember um, in 1977, the year we opened this, sometime it must have been around the springtime, hearing about um, this small company that was launching this computer. And I drove down to Cupertino and walked into this office, and there's all these, you know, beige colored cases all over the place. And these two, two men, um, were pitching to me that I should get this Apple II instead, and turned out that it was the two Steves. And I looked at it, they gave me demos, and I said, yeah, looks, that's really cool. I like the sound, I like the, the color, I like the all that, but what about upper and lower case? And I said, oh, well, no, we don't, we don't think people need that, or we aren't going to do that. So I think it came down to that, plus my wife really liked the walnut sides that the Sol 20s had. They look less, in, you know, less like computers, maybe. Um, of course, we ended up with eventually like 40 or 50 computers and a mix of Apple IIs and Ataris and Atari 800s and 400s. And, and we got a bunch of grants uh, where we could use that for outreach and for teaching classes. We taught programming classes. And one of the things we did a lot was um, we'd have these, our volunteer kids would come in and they'd play games that were now being sold, including like, you know, the Adventure International games. And we would end up with a rating system. We would then rate them for a Creative Computing Magazine, write up reviews about them. Uh, we ended up getting the opportunity to do some conversions. Um, we ended up converting some of Scott Adams' early games to the Apple II and the CPM machines. And in the process, wrote this conversion, the software that called, we call, ended up calling Apple Spice, which Adventure International also sold for us. Uh, which was es essentially an assembly-based extension to um, the basic that came with the Apple IIs to give it the same functionality that the Radio Shack computers had. The um, Apple II basic didn't have if then else, for example, and Scott's original Radio Shack code had that. And so rather than rewriting all the code, we added to the language to make it easier to do that and a bunch of other things like string searches and things. Um, but in, in process of doing that, I got to take apart other people's games, learn a lot about games and, you know, finding bugs and, you know, suggestions to improve them. And, you know, I was taught by, you know, self-taught by looking at other people's work. Um, ended up doing some books on programming. Uh, I wrote two, co-wrote two books with a friend of mine, Mitch Waite. Um, and the second book, which was on animation, let me... Uh, go to a local company that was doing some amazing stuff with high-end animation, which was the Lucasfilm computer division. And they had just completed doing some work on Star Trek II, uh, The Wrath of Khan, where they had this genesis effect, where this whole planet was being terraformed and uh, got to use images from, from that in the book and got to interview with people, got to know some of the people and hung out with, with some of the computer division people of the next SIGGRAPH. And um, when my book was finally finished a year later, I heard that through a friend of mine who worked at Industrial Light and Magic, that they were um, just starting up a new games group and I should check it out. So I contacted um, Ed Catmull, who was the head of the computer division, um, and uh, so they were just hiring someone to run the project you run the, the group and give me a couple weeks and I'd come in and interview so I was actually the second outside person that was hired into the games group um, after Peter Langston who was the who was the guy hired to manage it originally um, and so I was there at the beginning um, I think I used my my book on computer animation as essentially like here look what I've done and it happened that the uh, Atari had uh, paid Lucasfilm 
million dollars to help start up this um, games group with the idea that they get uh, right of first refusal for any games that we produce for Atari computers. So the fact that my book was on Atari, about the Atari computers and animation, and I was logo, and I was had this background of games, and Peter was also looking for people who were not typical game industry people. He didn't want to just he wanted to kind of start from scratch and maybe come up with methodologies that were not the same things people had done before. Kind of like break into new territory. So a lot of the hires were not you know the the well known game designers and people at the time. And he took a chance on a bunch of us, and I think we did some really fun stuff. So well, let's go. Let's go back a little bit uh, when you were working with these uh, Adventure International games. Did you uh, work with Scott Adams? Um, we talked um, by phone, uh, and yeah, you know, I think I remember finding a bug or two and say, "Hey, when when this happens, this should what happens when this goes?" And he said, "Oh, okay." You know, because I was in the middle of the source code, um, and then he actually, like I mentioned, he paid us a royalty for doing the conversions and also for selling our Apple Spice product. Um, but, not, you know, I think I met him. Maybe it, there, they had these West Coast computer fairs back then that I would go to in the Bay Area. And uh, so I think I met him at least once or twice. Um, and then I lost touch. They did connect with him maybe 10 or 15 years ago to say hello. And that's about it. All right, so Lucasfilm Games. I mean, everybody's heard heard of uh, that company. You know, I was uh, really fascinated by this partnership with with Atari. You know, that must have been just an absolutely uh, amazing time uh, just to be there. You know, at the ground level during the the first few projects. I, I'm not sure what was the uh, the very first uh, Lucasfilm game. Well, we did two concurrently. One was the one I worked on, which is Rescue on Fractalus, right. and the other one was Ballblazer, which David Levine was the programmer designer for. And on my for my game, um, when I first started working at Lucas, uh, I was they didn't have a special space for the games people, so we ended up sharing offices until our our building was ready with people from the computer division. And I somehow ended up in the office with Lauren Carpenter who I actually had met a year before when we were, when I was doing the book and Lauren was known for doing fractals and creating fractal landscapes, animated landscapes. Um, he was, you know, he is, he's a brilliant uh, programmer and coder. He's now, you know, as, as the rest of the computer division was purchased um, by Steve Jobs as Pixar, that became Pixar. So Lauren's, I, last I talked to him was his chief scientist at Pixar and uh, I asked Lauren, hey, is it possible to do a fractal, real-time fractal game on an 8-bit computer, like an Atari 800 uh, or Atari 5200, which is the gaming system? And I think his first reaction was, no, I don't think we could do it. And then you think, well, maybe. And then he, he comes back, you know, I think he, you know, a day or so later, he, he borrowed one of our eight, Atari 800s, went home, learned 6502 assembly language, came back like in a couple of days with a prototype I and mean, literally it was a few days of a prototype of, of flying through over a landscape a fractal landscape and proved that it was possible and he got to he worked on the game you know getting the fractal 3d fractal stuff set um, had several other really great people like Charlie Kellner who who came over from Apple um, I actually met him while I was at the computer center um, and uh, several really good people on the project and it was so a really fun game i thought it was a great game for the time lots of videos on youtube you can check people doing it um the the, the probably the, the thing that people remember the most i can't take credit for since it was um in my original version of the game i was thinking that uh, i wanted to be kind of more of a pacifist and that you didn't have any rockets or fire buttons. That the only thing you could do was um, run into the, um, you know, go through the mountains really fast and have the enemy saucers chase you. And since they weren't as fast as you, they'd not be able to steer quickly and they'd crash into the mountains. So you kind of like leave them in and crash and they'd do it and go away. And that was kind of the, the original idea. And we had a, uh, early beta playtest session with George Lucas. He came over and spent like maybe 20 minutes, half an hour with the game. I showed it to him, he played it, and he says, 
well, where's the fire button? I said, well, there is no fire button. And he said, well, is that because there, was that a, a gameplay decision or was that a philosophical decision? Was it to make the game better or because you just don't want to do it? And I said, well, I think it was more philosophical. And he said, add a fire button. <laughs> and he also came up with the idea of creating some tension by having the aliens, having these aliens on the planet that every once in a while one would pop up and you know, what you thought maybe was a pilot running towards you turns out to be one of the aliens. And that used to I, scare me to death. Yeah, I still, I still <laughs> I, I collect stories of, of when people first had that happen because we yeah. got Atari to agree to not disclose that anywhere in the packaging. Um, and the first, I believe it was four levels that you play, maybe it was eight, um, didn't have any of these pop-up experiences so people got pretty used to playing the game and they were you know they're they're like yeah I, I could do this this is really cool and here comes the pilot oh he does have a green helmet looks a little different but uh <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see what happens and he pops up and you know his stories of people falling off their chairs and some little kid runs out of his house screaming through his mom because there was a monster in his computer and you know especially when people were doing this at night with huge you know turned up speakers turned on really loud and you know, just I, I probably scared more people. <laughs> <laughs> That's great stuff. I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, considering this was a Lucasfilm, and you uh, really were, you know, emphatic about having a credible uh, alternate universe for the game, right? You didn't just want to be in a random place that uh, didn't matter to anybody. Uh, so why wasn't uh, the game based on the uh, Star Wars uh, franchise? Well, that was my original design document was like, let's put this in the Star Wars universe. And, you know, that's, you know, the reason I, you know, be honest, the reason I was at Lucas was because I fell in love with, with Star Wars, um, you know, when it was out in 1977. In fact, I was even, my wife and I were considering moving outside of the Bay Area up to, up to Oregon um, to get better pricing on housing and stuff. And I said, you know, I, I'd love to work at Lucasfilm someday. Let's, let's not, if we move, I'll never get to do, to do that. And that was like maybe 1978. And four years later, I ended up with this job. So it was really something I wanted to do for a long time. Um, well, it turns out that at the time, Lucasfilm could get a lot more money by licensing Star Wars out to other companies. You get a guaranteed fee, whatever it was, you know, a million dollars or whatever, plus royalties. Um, where if we did it in-house, there'd be a risk because it'd be possible that our games wouldn't sell and they'd get nothing. So they, they pretty much had an edict for all the time I was there um, through all the 80s that we could not do Star Wars-based titles. And that totally turned around in the 90s where it eventually became pretty much only Star Wars titles. But in the early days, that wasn't a possibility. So that, you know, the, the, after the initial disappointment, I, mean, I still based... The I want the feeling to be like you were in a Star Wars like game, but without having Star Wars characters. And we actually found photographs and looked at a, a, a real um, X Wing cockpit, you know, that was in storage to, to see if I could get inspiration for putting the cockpit together for, for rescue. Um, but um, the because we weren't allowed to do you know, fall back on Star Wars. We had to be original. We had to come up with our own stuff that was good. And I think that was a blessing. You know, we we didn't have we didn't have that as a crutch. We had to come up with original stories and ideas and, and games that had nothing to do with that universe. The other positive was that we were pretty much left alone uh, because we weren't messing with the family jewels, essentially. Um, we could experiment and do what we wanted to do. And initially, we were very much an experimental group. Um, the first two games we did were built as throwaways, um, more as an experiment. Could we do it? Could we actually do a game that was fun? If so, we'd do something with them. If not, we'd toss it as, as a learning experiment and go on to something else. So I don't know that we would have had that much freedom, nor the um, fact that unlike most game companies, we didn't, we weren't the company wasn't surviving because of us. We we could pull money from the company and, and take time to get it right. 
You could afford to take risks, in other words. Yes, definitely risks. And there was no marketing like, no, I don't think that game's going to work. It was like, what do you want to do? And we come up with a design doc and we pass it around to the other game designers. And people say, yeah, that sounds like fun. And we'd end up generally with brainstorming sessions with the different game designers at the time and polish the ideas. And um, But it was all without, you know, it was never with, with a marketing department coming in and saying, yes or no, or maybe, or add this to it, or, 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 you know, it was just, it was left up to the designers. I don't know what it's like now. I just know that's what it was like during the, during the first decade. I think the the phase you went through is, was heaven. <laughs> <laughs> the phase that we're in now is hell. <laughs> you know, one thing that might've been a plus is that at the time also games weren't as expensive to make as they are now. So, you know, I don't know, games were maybe, in, in those dollars, in, in 1980 dollars, you know, 150,000, 200,000 um, for, you know, for games marketing the whole thing. And, you know, now they could go up to the tens of 20s, 30s millions. Which, so, you, you know, just like with a big movie, you want to be really sure that it's going to be successful before you sink your money into it. Um, with us, it you know, was not that, uh, you know, it wasn't going to be that huge of a loss. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part two of my interview with Mr. David Fox. Got a lot of great stuff coming up, so if you like part one, you're definitely going to want to stick around for the subsequent parts. A lot of great stuff. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. Um, you may have noticed uh, my last video, the gameplay uh, capture footage wasn't quite uh, where it needs to be. Uh, the problem is uh, my PC just can't really handle uh, capturing uh, stuff from the 360 or, or newer games. It really taxes it to try to record, you know, at the same time as I'm playing these things. I uh, talked to my friend uh, Bill Judas from Armchair Arcade about it, and he has recommended a couple of devices uh, that will allow me to capture gameplay from my PC or the, uh, the consoles in 1080i, uh, all without taxing my PC at all. This is independent, um, totally independent from my PC. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, the only problem is it's going to cost about uh, somewhere between 150 to 200 bucks. I do have some money in the account, but uh, not that much. So if you've got a few extra dollars or if you, you know, have been uh, holding off on uh, donating to the show, uh, please uh, step forward and chip in so we can start watching these videos with gameplay footage in lovely 1080i. That <laughs> sounds really exciting uh, to me. Now let's see about that ale of the week. Uh, I have uh, something that's uh, very, very special indeed. Uh, this is a barley wine ale. Uh, it's from the Epic <laughs> Brewing Company, great name, Exponential Series. And I, was, I didn't realize this when I purchased it. You know, this wasn't like this was a, you know, an expensive uh, ale. Uh, but it says here that this is apparently only uh, one of 1,800 numbered brews. So this is uh, number four. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, the alcohol content is sort of blurred out, though. I can't see it, but it looks like maybe 10.5%. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, open this up and see what, and see if it's really epic. All right, so let's give her a smell. <sighs> Very pleasant smell. Um, sort of a, what I would call a floral scent, like fresh flowers. Uh, very pleasant. I don't know if I'd want to wear it as a cologne, but uh, quite nice. And... Uh, before I uh, drink it, though, I want to toast. I want to toast you, Mr. Robert Schultz. Thank you very much for your support of the show. All right, let's see what we got here. Ah, very, uh, very good taste. Um, very sweet. We got a sort of a syrupy caramel coffees and cherries uh, with maybe a little bit of a uh, maybe well, what I would call black cherry, if you've ever had a black cherry soda. Uh, not bitter at all, and don't really taste any alcohol. I have to say this is a really, really good brew. I uh, really enjoy this. Uh, you know, <laughs> what can I say? It's, it's epic! Uh, definitely if you see this uh, lying around at <laughs> your uh, local ale distributor, I would highly recommend picking it up. I'm quite impressed, actually. It's uh, good stuff, and I don't even taste any uh, alcohol, <laughs> but, but it's in there, so uh, 
I better get this uh, video wrapped up. All right, the quotation for this week comes from Irvin Kirshner. Now, he is the a mentor of George Lucas, and he directed the best Star Wars movie ever made, The Empire Strikes Back. I mean, come on, guys. Uh, and it's a bit lengthy, but I thought it just really resonated. I, I love this quotation, so I, I wrote it down to make sure that I could get it exactly right. And the, uh, the epic brew is not helping, so <laughs> uh, let's, get this, uh, let's get this done. All right. Something has happened in our time, and it's only profit that seems to count. Not what a film says, or what it can do for people. We are living in a time of moral indifference. But I think it will change. See you guys next week. I wonder why they hang around him. Mm, probably just charisma.